Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this discussion this evening brought to you by the American Heart Association. I am Pamela Garman Johnson, National Vice President of Health Equity and Partnerships, as well as the Executive Director for the National Hypertension Control Initiative for the American Heart Association. Welcome. I am so excited to moderate tonight's panel because we have a much needed conversation to discuss housing and health so that we can recognize and understand that it is a basic right for a healthier life. As a part of today's Clarion Call, we will discuss how as community leaders and stakeholders, your faith-based institutions and can play a role in affordable housing. We have been able to work with faith-based institutions across this country as an organization for a long time. And now we are exploring a new way to work with them as it pertains to affordable housing. And so we are working alongside one of our powerful partners, Enterprise Community Partners, because of a generous grant from the Kresge Foundation. Joining me tonight is an incredible and dynamic panel of experts and servant leaders who have made it a part of their mission to bring fair and equitable housing to all. Lourdes Castro Ramirez is the Secretary of Business, Consumer Services and Housing Agency for the state of California and has been serving in this role since March, 2020 when she was appointed by California Governor Newsom. As secretary, she leads and oversees 10 state entities responsible for expanding affordable housing, developing comprehensive solutions to end homelessness, guarding civil rights protections, regulating banking and financial services, and strengthening consumer protections within the licensing of nearly 4 million working professionals. Secretary Castro Ramirez has held many notable and prominent positions, including being appointed by President Barack Obama to lead the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Office of Public and Indian Housing. And congratulations today on your win to end homelessness for the state of California. Welcome, Lourdes. Jacqueline Wagner is the president of the Solutions Division for Enterprise Community Partners. She leads a team of over 300 people across the country, driving enterprises programmatic policy and advisory work in alignment with the organization's strategic priorities to increase housing supply, advance racial equity, and build upward mobility and resilience. Prior to her promotion to president, Jacqueline was vice president and market leader for Southern California. She led enterprises, affordable housing, community development, investment and strategic programs, serving the state's central coast to San Diego. She serves as vice chair of the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority Commission and chair of its ad hoc committee on black people experiencing homelessness. Welcome Jacqueline. Dr. Eduardo Sanchez serves as chief medical officer of prevention for the American Heart Association. He is the principal investigator of the National Hypertension Control Initiative, working with the Federal Office of Minority Health and Health Resources and Service Administration. So that means we get to work together closely every single day. I learn a lot from him, I really do. He is the AHA clinical lead on Target BP and No Diabetes by Heart. He is one of the authors of the AHA's Presidential Advisory on Structural Racism and its Health Effects. Dr. Sanchez served as director of the Texas Department of State Health Services from 2001 to 2006. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez, for joining us this evening. Well, welcome to each of you that have joined us this evening, and I thank our distinguished panelists for joining us and being with us. So studies have shown that a person's access to affordable housing and lack of housing security can have a direct impact 
on their cardiovascular health and increase of risk factors, including high blood pressure. So let's talk about the connection between safe, affordable housing and health. So Lourdes, I'd like to start with you first. Yes, uh, thank you, first of all, Pamela, so much for the invitation. I am so happy to join Dr. Eduardo Sanchez and Jacqueline Wagner for this very important conversation. And I also like to uh, thank the American Heart Association for convening uh, this uh, community and faith-based, basically convening uh, community and faith-based leaders to discuss uh, the connection, uh, the connection between health and housing and also lifting up the importance of equity in all of the work that we do. I do firmly believe that housing and health are inseparable. Uh, and as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has shined, frankly, a stronger light on this uh, in calling attention and a sense of urgency for us to do more. We know that uh, even before the pandemic, families were struggling with the lack of affordable housing uh, struggling to pay the rent, uh, to keep a roof over their head. And you know, I think it's important to understand the why. You know, why have families over the last few years uh, experienced this struggle and this inability to uh, keep uh, housing or to stay uh, housed? Uh, and, you know, I would um, like to maybe just share briefly the three sort of primary reasons for this affordable housing crisis that many cities and states are experiencing. Uh, first, I think it's important to recognize that there are uh, fewer housing units available. Uh, so there's a lack of housing units. Housing supply has not been able to keep up with demand. Uh, also, I think another really important um, indicator and metric that we should uh, pay attention to is that there's been a growing gap between what people earn and the rising cost of housing. In fact, over the last 20 years, rents have doubled uh, in many cities, including many cities here in the state of California. Uh, and then the third reason for this housing affordability crisis uh, is frankly, the lack of uh, adequate federal housing assistance. Only one out of every six families that qualifies for federal housing assistance is currently receiving it. So this combination has made it very difficult for working families, for senior citizens on fixed incomes, for young people and communities of color to, um, you know, to really be able to stay housed and maintain a good quality of life and those stressors begin to affect your health. Uh, let me also share a couple of other sort of statistics. Um, in the state of California, renting is almost as cost burdensome as home ownership. One third of all renters pay more than 50% of their income on rent. So again, families are struggling to pay their rent. Uh, and when you're struggling to pay your rent, there is fewer uh, disposable income to be able to attend to other important, important and basic needs, including taking care of your health and paying for medical expenses. During this pandemic, um, this situation was made worse. Um, families, um, individuals lost their jobs, low wage and service sectors were uh, overrepresented, um, overrepresented by black, Latino, indigenous and people of color. These were the communities that were hardest hit uh, and many um, were left with having to make uh, a decision between paying the rent and putting food on, on their table. So we know that having uh, access to stable housing is critically important. Um, it allows for individuals and families to put nutritious food on the table, to re provide reliable daycare for their children, and also you know, gives um, individuals the ability to attend to their health and medical needs. Uh, but let, let me just kind of finish you know, my sort of point on, on why it's so important, right, that we focus on affordable housing and that we continue to link housing and health. And I'd like to you know, just share a very concrete example uh, through uh, the story of Ruth, 
Um, Ruth is um, an, uh, an individual that we had the opportunity to meet uh, during our response to this pandemic uh, and, and uh, really you know, during our uh, ongoing efforts with uh, local, um, a local community in Southern California. Uh, so, you know, Ruth had been living uh, out of her truck for two years um, after a very messy divorce. She was diagnosed with uh, congestive heart failure and was um, basically you know, living with about a 20% heart capacity. Her doctors told her that she needed to find stable housing and live in a lower altitude um, community. So, you know, she needed a place to live, a, a place to focus on her health, a place um, to be able to attend to her, her medical and health needs. Uh, and thanks to an initiative that we were able to launch um, in partnership with local cities and counties, an initiative that we call Home Key, uh, which enabled us to provide funding from the state, um, a total of $846 million to fund the purchase of hotels and vacant buildings. Um, the city in which Ruth lives was able to purchase a property, a property with six units and convert that property into permanent housing. And this all happened within a period of six months uh, because we were leveraging federal dollars that needed to be expended by the end of um, December of 2020. Uh, and, you know, just, uh, as it happened, uh, Ruth was connected to the housing and homelessness agency that was working closely with the city. Uh, she was able to get her name on the list and she was at the top of the list. And so when Ruth got word that she was uh, going to have a place to call home, she reached out to us. And I'd like to just share um, as I conclude my response, um, what she shared with us. Uh, she said, Thank you for believing in me. You will never know how grateful I am. All it took was a little help. For the first time, I feel free of my past and ready to conquer anything. I could not have done this without you and your support. I actually got down on my knees and I thanked our Lord for you and for helping me get out of this mess. So without this opportunity, you know, Ruth would have been living on the streets under a lot of stress and at risk for continuing to lose her health. Uh, and so this is why this work matters uh, for people like Ruth. Uh, and uh, again, I really um, commend you all for bringing us together for this conversation. Thank you so much, Lourdes. And it's amazing when we listen and can address a person's need, the impact that we can have, which is a great transition to Dr. Sanchez um, to talk about how the American Heart Association is addressing the needs of individuals um, while improving their risk factors, including high blood pressure. Dr. Sanchez. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me, having me, and Pamela, yeah, it's great to work with you every single day. I learn from you every single day. Um, Secretary Castro Ramirez said something uh, that I think bears repeating, and that is that housing and health are inseparable. Uh, they are inextricably tied. They are the, the, among the things that contribute to good health, and more importantly, contribute to our ability to thrive. Uh, because being healthy is really, really important, but thriving is the end game. Being a, a great parent, being a great partner, being a great employee, uh, being a great person in society. Um, people smarter than me break it down like this. The things that contribute to our health are as follows. Clinical care, 20%. I want to repeat that clinical care, 20%, which is a low, a low number compared to the things I'm going to talk about. Lifestyle and behavior, the ability to eat healthy, the ability to be physically active, not smoking, um, drinking in moderation, if at all, 30%. Socioeconomics, which is part of what uh, Secretary Castro Ramirez was talking about, that's your educational attainment, that's um, your income, that's access to health care, having insurance, 40%. And then environment, 
which includes housing, really the quality of your housing and where that housing is located, along with air and water quality, contribute to 10, contribute 10%. Now, what I don't want you to conclude is that, well, housing is only 10%. No, 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 no. Because what you heard from Secretary Castro Ramirez is that <clears throat> there are things that are interconnected. So unaffordability means you don't have the money to buy healthy food. You may not have the money to buy your um, medications for whatever condition may have been um, one that your doctor diagnosed. And um, you by virtue of unaffordability, you probably have a low paying job. So it's all interconnected. And that 10% is probably a higher number, like 25, 30, 40%, because of the connection of all things related to the issue of unaffordable housing. There's an interesting study that was shared with me by our team this is an observational study. So I wanna be clear, this doesn't mean that <clears throat> poor housing causes X, Y, or Z, but renters in high foreclosure risk areas had higher prevalences of high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And again, think about it. If you are living in an area that is at high risk of foreclosure, that probably means all the other things I said you don't have disposable income in the moment, um, you're not able to eat healthy, and oh, by the way, your stress level is probably off the charts, which also contributes to higher blood pressure and contributes to lower quality of life and the inability to thrive. So the American Heart Association has connected all those dots. And we used to be an organization that focused on what does the doctor do if you have a heart attack? And what does the doctor do if you have high blood pressure? And we're beginning to realize we need to be in the game like today. What can we do collectively with partners like enterprise, with partners like folks in government, with partners like the faith community to address housing? Because housing and making sure that families are in safe, affordable housing can contribute to and make it easier even for doctors to treat that high blood pressure and perhaps even prevent that heart attack, stroke, or heart failure from occurring. So I hope that's what you were looking for, Pamela, because that's where I took it. Oh, that was right on the money, Dr. Sanchez. And quite frankly, this is the work that we truly work on every day, being able to figure out how do we draw those parallels and connect the dots for individuals, because when we are able to do that, address their basic needs, then we can work toward them having improved health. So Ms. Wagner, Jacqueline, we would love for you to weigh in on this particular um, question. Well, first of all, it's hard to follow these two because they it's almost like they read my notes. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, so excited to be here. I also want to thank the American Heart Association for their foresight to understand the interconnectedness interconnectedness between health and housing. And I think we really learned through the pandemic that these things are all interconnected. The world can see it, the disparities because of race, housing affordability, and people that are predisposed to COVID. So I feel like I'm among my tribe this evening as we're talking about this. Um, Pamela, you shared a little bit about what Enterprise does and housing affordability. And at the end of the day, um, um, Dr. Uh, Sanchez, you touched on this, but um, a board member of mine, uh, Dr. Megan Sandell, said housing is a vaccine. And I agree with that. And what we're hearing today is that while you can focus on your health, if you're sending a sick patient back to somewhere where they're stressed, they're struggling, this is their biggest expense, you can't expect them to get better. So these things are interconnected. The stability of a safe and stable home that's free of lead and other things and healthy conditions are essential so that people can get on their feet, um, get to work, um, you know, access healthcare um, and just have a better life. And so at Enterprise, we note that importance and you can't talk about one without the other because if you don't have good health and you don't have a good home, there's nothing that else is gonna go right for you um, in, in life. And so, so excited to be talking about this. And, 
when we think about the tough choices that people would have to make if they didn't have housing they can afford, um, it's, it, it depends if they can afford the medicine they need, the healthy food choices they can make that would decrease their ch chances of hypertension and, and, and stroke. So I think it's really important that we really invest in housing that people could afford to make sure that people have a better chance at a better life of, of, uh, and not experiencing such um, um, things. Um, we talked about it lightly about equity, but um, I have my black and brown people on the camera with me here today. Let's talk about disparity a little bit. Uh, black and brown people households are, um, my stat says are twice as likely to experience housing insecurity. They're more likely to experience eviction, hypertension, um, you know, strokes, it's all interconnected. So I think what we're saying is that if we're going to help people get healthier, we need to start with a stable home. That's the foundation of it. And I really saw the slides that you put up before the show about like the health component being 20% of it. And Lourdes, you nailed it when you talked about those three buckets is that we've been uh, unfortunately building our way towards this because um uh, wages don't match housing costs. And so we also need to think about how we talk about jobs and other things. So we need to look at the whole person as we look at solutions around health and housing. Thank no, you. I, oh, no, thank you. And I love um, each of the stats that were brought forward, as well as, you know, we have a crisis in front of us and we're trying to tackle all components of it at the same time. But if you really think about it, it's the basic needs of a person. And so in some ways, when you think about the um, improvement of a person's health, 80% of it sits outside of the clinical setting. So how do we work as powerful partners and have these types of discussions um, as well as with the other channels that are found to be trusted channels in the community, like the faith community, to ensure that we are creating the right ecosystem to improve health. So Jacqueline, I'm going to have you push a little further. Mm. I'm talking about the quality of neighborhoods and what we can do so that we can have improved health. Well, first of all, Enterprise uh, Community Partners is a national housing organization, but we just don't look at housing. We also look at the entire neighborhood because we know the social determinants of health are so important to people's lives. And so people need to live in affordable homes and neighborhoods that are connected to jobs, health care, uh, and other resources that they need to, to thrive. And so when we make investments at Enterprise, we think about um, how housing is designed. Is it green? Is it resilient? Do people live in a walkable neighborhood? Are they close to transit? Is it near services? And I want to say that that is essential, that we can't think about this in small pieces. We talked about affordability, but I would say also green. We want to make sure that the space that people are living in is also healthy, because we know a lot of people are predisposed and live in older buildings and disp um, uh, predisposed to such things as lead and other things. So it's essential about design. And then when they leave their front door, how do they move, get exercise, um, how their proximity to work, transportation, and services is essential. And I want to say um, we, we started, um, uh, we launched a program in 2019 um, called Health Begins with Home Initiative, which we agree, agreed to invest roughly $250 million uh, over five years. And we were really investing in impacts um, in whole neighborhoods. And we've been doing with that with amazing partners like the American Heart Association, Kaiser Permanente, Permanente, United Healthcare, and we are really tracking our way in the goal. And to say that American Heart Association, Cresby, Cresby United Healthcare, and Kaiser focus on this, I think we're all aware that these, the, the close connection to it, the fact that these health institutions and these foundations are saying we see the connection and we want to support investment in a more thoughtful way so it benefits people that are in the community. You know, what I love about all that you said is it's these unusual relationships that become powerful partners. And that is my lingo all the time. It's about the importance of powerful partnerships. 
And so, Lourdes, I would love for you to weigh in here to talk about how do you see housing and health and, and being able to focus in specifically on neighborhoods and improving the quality of those neighborhoods. Yes, thank you, Pamela. I, um, I love the way that you summarize, right, uh, how um, important it is that we create partnerships. And I just want to remind everyone that's uh, joined us tonight that government um, is a very important partner and we recognize the value of partnering with local communities, with local leaders, with philanthropy, with federal government. Uh, so I am very excited you know, to be in state government because I think that we are in, um, we're in this sort of very unique role, especially under this current administration at the federal level that recognizes the importance of investing in people, investing in communities, investing in housing. And I think that, you know, to build on Jacqueline's um, point, it's important for us to not just stop at the quality of the housing or the affordability of the housing, but it's important to look at the fabric of that community and how those housing investments are, are connected or integrated uh, within community. So at the state level, we're very mindful uh, of um, furthering our investments and uh, really creating an environment that allows for local communities to think about how the housing investments are connected to transit, connected to education, connected to the amenities that families need, uh, connected to a neighborhood that is walkable. Uh, and much of this is driven uh, also um, through what we call our fair housing, um, our fair housing principles. And the fair housing principles basically are um, focused on one, recognizing that many of our neighborhoods, particularly those that are uh, where there is an overrepresentation of people of color or low income communities, have been historically um, neighborhoods that have been disinvested, um, that have been left behind. And so you have um, this kind of layering, right, of disinvestment, poor health outcomes poor access to transit and education. Uh, and you're basically entrapping people to stay in, um, in this situation. Um, so from a fair housing perspective, when we're investing, what we're looking for is we want to see communities do everything possible to address these residential segregated um, or these you know segregated patterns that we see in rich residential communities and we want to uh, be able to see affordable housing being built in neighborhoods that are well resourced that are off that basically offer uh, opportunities right for children and families to be able to thrive but we also are very committed and know that it's important to not forget um, the neighborhoods that have um, experienced disinvestment for many, many years. Um, so I think it's important when we think about um, creating neighborhoods that are healthy, that will enable children and adults to reach their, reach their potential, we need to have a balanced approach. Uh, we need to ensure that we're creating housing in neighborhoods that are well off, but we also need to invest in poor neighborhoods and improve the infrastructure, improve the access to the amenities that, um, that are necessary uh, and, and not um, do so sort of at the expense, right, of, um, of, of those families. Um, so critically important for us to think about housing um, and the, quality of the neighborhood, but critically important for us to recognize that not all neighborhoods have been, um, have, been have received an equitable um, distribution of resources um, or an equitable sort of um, attention, right, you know, to, um, to their infrastructure and to um, their patterns of development. So we need to reverse that trend. Um, and so we need to do so in, in a balanced way. You know, um, thank you so much, Lourdes. That's the reason why for me, 
I don't like using the term vulnerable communities. I like saying under-resourced communities because it's the lack of investment and resources put in those communities that make them um, not have the same um, life expectancy and increasing their social determinants of health, which I did wanna just put a little bit of a plug in real quick because we utilize that term quite a bit. And sometimes, and I just, for our audience, I just wanna talk about what that means. And so we're talking about it. So it is the lack of affordable housing. It is the lack of access to quality healthcare. It's the lack of um, access to quality foods. It's the lack of transportation. I think Jacqueline mentioned, you know, being able to have access to, um, you know, um, transportation to be able to go to your appointments, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure that our audience really understands what the social determinants of health is because we work in this every day from a public health standpoint, but just for them to really understand what those, um, what that acronym means. And so Dr. Sanchez, I would love for you to talk a little bit about um, how the AHA is addressing the social determinants of health and really um, why we started to focus on the social determinants of health and maybe connect between our 2020 goal to our 2024 goal and what that shift looked like and what the impact that it's going to have on our country. Thanks, thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of the comments that have been made because I think they were really awesome. Um, <clears throat> um, I, like you, uh, I just... Uh, I think the word vulnerable ought to be used when it's appropriate to use it. So um, the elderly, vulnerable, because they can't always take care of themselves. <clears throat> Small children, vulnerable, because they can't take care of themselves. But communities that have been um, disinvested um, have the potential to be every bit as viable and thriving as any other. And that's not vulnerable. That's, um, that's uh, um, uh, uh, you know, that's failure to thrive because we're not feeding the, the neighborhood what it needs. So I completely agree. And I love the fact that you, um, uh, Secretary Castro-Hermitas, that you brought equity into the picture. <clears throat> so in medicine, uh, when someone comes in and they don't have a health problem, we focus on prevention. I'm the chief medical officer for prevention. That's what I do. But at the same time, if a patient comes in and has high blood pressure and um, is Ruth with congestive heart failure, I'm going to do everything that needs to be done to take care of um, Ruth. In an equality model, as you know, I would do exactly the same for both patients. That doesn't make any sense because Ruth is sicker than John. Um, and so in an equity model, what you're doing is trying to achieve the, the, the outcome for both of them, optimal health. And so in some instances, it's gonna take more than one medication to get there. In some instances, it's gonna take a little bit of extra counseling. So I bring that up because I'm gonna back my way into the question that Pamela put in front of me. As I said earlier, the American Heart Association started 100 years ago almost, um, uh, and I'll explain that in a moment, um, with a focus on what to do when something really bad happens. Someone has a stroke, someone has a heart attack, someone um, uh, suddenly they quit having a heart rate, heart rhythm, and you need to resuscitate them. Uh, we came to realize that there were risk factors that seemed to correlate with some of those things. Um, and if you control people's high blood pressure, uh, less likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. And if you control the cholesterol, same thing. And if you um, managed um, and paid attention to weight, and healthy eating and physical activity, same thing. But we also, as we um, were looking at those things, we came to realize that sometimes we were telling, and I, I learned this as a doctor, I was saying to my patients, Ms. Gonzalez, um, you, you, you need to eat healthier. And I was reminded by Ms. Gonzalez, doctor, um, I want to eat healthy, but I can't afford the food that I need to buy to be healthy. And oh, by the way, I, um, she didn't say this, but I don't live in a healthy neighborhood because my neighborhood does not have a supermarket. And I have to take two buses to get whatever I can get in a couple of bags and bring it back. Um, and so 
the American Heart Association came to realize that the, 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 the focus on the bad thing was a good start. The focus on the risk factors was a good step upstream, beginning to understand that there are socioeconomic, cultural, racial factors that contribute to one's ability to um, manage in their own health. That is to eat healthy, to be in affordable housing, to be able to exercise or do physical activity every day. If you're busy trying to figure out how you're going to get to work and then to your second job, um, the time that you may have to not only be physically active, but to read to your kids is minimized because you've got to be trying to earn a buck um, getting paid minimum wage, which really should just be called insufficient wage. Um, and it's just not enough to live on. So AHA is interested in this. We've published a scientific paper about the relationship between housing and health. And I do wanna reiterate some things um, uh, because these are the qualities they were already mentioned. I'm just going to reiterate them because they're so critically important. And again, all of us, including um, government, including AHA, including enterprise, including faith-based communities, including other community-based organizations, can be a part of trying to find the solution or find the path to healthier neighborhoods. And would agree with you, uh, uh, Secretary Castro Ramirez, that we can... Uh, build on those that are already pretty good, but we need to also invest in those that um, could use some investment. I'll just leave it at that. Um, a healthy neighborhood is a place where all residents can thrive. All residents in that community can thrive. And there's some good science about what does that take. It takes mixed housing. So um, people who are lower income, people who are middle income, people who are high income, all in the same neighborhood. It takes great schools. And one of the unfortunate relationships is that where there is unaffordable housing, too often the schools are not the best quality schools. We need to invest in the neighborhood and in the schools. Great jobs are nearby. I say nearby, it'd be ideal if they were right there in the neighborhood but maybe you don't have to go too far to get a great job. There's social cohesion. That's the neighborhood where people go outside and talk to their neighbors, where people feel safe walking up and down the block, whether that's because um, there's not a lot of high speed cars, not a lot of loose dogs and not any crime at all. It's a place where you can let your kid out the door and not worry about not having heard from them for an hour or two, because it's a safe, healthy neighborhood. I mentioned supermarkets, and I'm gonna close with walkability. These are neighborhoods where people can walk, um, young people, kids, old people, bicycles, um, all have a place where they can coexist with one another and result in people waving at one another. And I live in a neighborhood where even at this time of COVID, we, we um, very respectfully walk to other sides of the street, but we wave at one another and nod and feel safe in our neighborhoods. So Pamela and AHA has come to realize that is as much and as is, is as important as writing a guideline about how to manage stroke in the hospital when someone's had one. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanchez, and um, very poignant points. And um, what I think about is now, as we transition a little bit, I wanna build upon what you just said, the social cohesion and then being in a safe space and how important it is to think about that as we are building communities. And so actually, Jacqueline, I'd like for you to weigh in and talk about how are communities built? How do we create this social cohesion? How do we have walkability and green space? How does that happen? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Sanchez. You speak in my language. I mean, when you're talking about walkability, connection to jobs, I was like, oh, he's a houser now too. 
<laughs> this is uh, pretty cool. So first of all, you know, um, how enterprise looks at it, you have to plan, right? You know, Lourdes and I are both urban planners and you have to think about that whole person. What do they need to be successful? And it starts with housing, access to services such as healthcare, transportation, other things. But um, one of the things we thought was important was design. And thank you, Dr. Sanchez, uh, Sanchez for your support of our Green Communities Program. Because one of the things that we noted was that people need to live in healthy spaces, right? Like their environment, their environmental, um, well, the environmental well-being is also important, like, you know, um, that uh, the design actually supports people's good health. We know that also a lot of um, people are imp impacted by asthma or lead poisoning and other things. And so we want to do something about design so that as we build, we build healthier indoor spaces for people as well. And so we started that 15 years ago and most states across the country have adopted our green community practices and most builders of, of affordable housing and, and market rate in some cases have to include these standards. So we we started there. So if everybody's doing it, it's echoed throughout, no matter where you move, if it's happening, you're likely to live in a healthier space. The other thing is last year, we partnered with International Wellbeing Institute to make sure Community wellness um, is a part of every enterprise community uh, property. And people that know us, we've invested in 793,000 homes across the country, and that's a big number. We, we're still on the pathway of building more, and so that's essential to how we're thinking. And really, it really brings design to the center stage about healthy housing. So we talk about the housing indoor, but also what happens in the community. And to your point, Dr. Sanchez, making sure it's green, walkable, and there's other design strategies to make sure that people can have healthy living and that social cohesion and safe communities is a part of people getting outdoors because the likelihood of you walking out without those things is slim. So it's so important that we do design in a way where people want to come outdoors and exercise and walk and visit their neighbors and walk to healthy stores instead of catching two buses and a train to get to some healthy options. And so it's important that we think about that in advance and don't think about it afterwards. So having conversations like this is essential for people to begin to think bigger about how they design communities. And public agencies are critical part of that work. Which is a great segue into Lourdes. And um, Lourdes, why don't you talk about your role in San Antonio, the work you did there, your previous role before that? Um, because I think when we talk about how to build communities, you know, um, you all study that, you and Jacqueline, that is your background, right? But sometimes we don't even recognize that even when we vote for certain things, how important the infrastructure is and that the infrastructure is put where it is actually needed, where there is the greatest inequity. So if you could weigh in. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pamela. I, uh, I'm glad that Jacqueline reminded um, and shared with all of you, uh, reminded me and, and shared with all of you that we're urban planners. And Jacqueline and I actually met uh, at UCLA in the urban planning program. And one of the philosophies of the urban planning program was that we don't plan for communities, we plan with communities. And so what that means is that it's very important that as we begin to address these inequities or uh, disparities or, or look to create stronger, healthier um, neighborhoods, it has to be done with the people that live there, right? It has, it has to be their vision. It has to be their aspirations. And that's what I have learned, Pamela, in the work that I've done, whether it was, you know, when I worked at Imperial Courts, um, uh, you know, with the LA City Housing Authority, um, to, you know, my time uh, with the San Antonio Housing Authority, where we led a number of uh, neighborhood revitalization efforts. It was critically important for us to build the trust and the relationship with residents from that community. And uh, another, you know, important philosophy that I embrace that I think is, is very important is to, to build communities from the inside out. Meaning you need to, you know, that it's important for us to acknowledge the strength 
that people bring, the experience, the perspective. Um, so, you know, oftentimes, and unfortunately, much of government um, and even philanthropy is under this um, model of tell me what you need. What are the deficiencies? What are the deficits of this community? Uh, very much like what are the gaps? And then you build from there. I think it's important to start with what are the strengths? What do people bring, right? Uh, and that's why I'd love what um, uh, I think you said, Pamela, that we need to be careful about when we use the word vulnerable communities because you know it it conjures up an image of you know communities not being capable um, of being able to transform their lives. Uh, and so I I would just say that as we work together, uh, government, philanthropy, enterprise, the American Heart Association, local leaders, it, it's important to, to do so side by side with the people that live in that neighborhood so that they are shaping their destiny and their future um, and owning, right, um, that this, this is theirs, right? Uh, so, so I was glad, Jacqueline, that you you shared that we were urban planners because that was like lesson one. We don't plan for them. We we plan with community members. Oh, you know what? All I could do was smile. And I'm sure Dr. Sanchez was smiling. I couldn't see when I was writing down. But when you say plan with communities, it's the same thing we say about we partner with the patient person. You have to, because you're working together to get to a better outcome. And so if it's a do unto you type situation, that never lasts and, it, and you're not listening to each other. There's no relationship, there's no trust built. And I think that's where we really are in our country. It's an opportunity right now in our country to build trust and while we're having this conversation tonight, because we recognize that the faith community is a trusted channel. And so we involve them in the ecosystem of being able to leverage their strengths. Lourdes, you were right on it. Leverage their strengths, leverage the strength of the government, leverage the strength of enterprise, leverage the strength of the American Heart Association and other CBOs then we're able to work toward having a better outcome, which is going to take us to our last question of the evening. And that is, you know, when we think about houses of worship and we think about community centers and other community-based organizations, you know, what, what models have you seen that you have contributed to, maybe you've invested in, or you've been able to be a catalyst for and uplifting that model. But I would love for each of you to just share based upon your current work, how you are leveraging those various entities and communities to really transform communities to make them better overall. And let's start with Jacqueline. Well, hallelujah. Thank you for picking me first on this one. Um, Enterprise was founded nearly 40 years ago in collaboration with the church. There was a community group in the Adams Morgan neighborhood in um, uh, the DC area that really wanted to preserve affordability in their community. And the founder of our organization asked them if they could raise some resources, he would match it. And it shows the power of when church leaders invest in the community and face outward and address the needs of the people that they that that are in the community that they thrive. So I really um, it's in our DNA uh, and it really informed how we got here. And to Lourdes's point, it was the people's voice that started enterprise. Um, you know, 40 years ago, it was the church, right? The cornerstone of the community. It's a voice that people trust. It's where people meet. Dr. Dr. Sanchez, to your point, it's where people meet. And that social cohesion is critical to our path forward in America. And so the church plays a critical role with that. And for the past decade, we have been working with faith-based institutions across this country 
to not only um, you know, work on community programs, but to also look at some of their vacant land and begin to build housing. And in that 10 year period, we've done roughly, I wanna say 15 new, 1500 new affordable homes across the country. We have another thousand homes in the pipeline. So churches, you can lead from your seat. You really can. People always say, well, how, do, how does this align with me, what I should be doing? If you're working in your church and you're working in the community, there is a way for you to play a role in the health and housing field. And thank you so much for the leadership of the American Heart Association, partnering with Enterprise, the Kresge Foundation, all of these critical partners, seeing that connection and seeing the value add of faith-based leaders and solutions in the community related to health and housing. And so really working together with faith-based leaders is a great way to hear from the community about what they want. And to Lourdes, to your point, we need to listen. And the church is a place where you do go to listen and learn. And so there's a lot of power there that could be absorbed in and, and help design what communities look like. And churches have a big role to play here. Like I said, uh, they helped us they helped us get started 40 years ago and $71 billion later and 793,000 homes and still counting. Uh, it's been critical because a church stepped up and said, I wanna serve the community. These people are threatened by being displaced and we wanna do something. So um, here, here to all the church leaders that are under my voice, you can make a difference too. Thank you for allowing me to share. Well, I think you might have a new career. Are you pivoting into becoming a minister? You were sounding like one, Jacqueline. <laughs> Lourdes, why don't you weigh in here? Impactful information though, Jacqueline, and impressive numbers and uh, around impact. Lourdes, why don't you weigh in here as well? Certainly, um, uh, Pamela. I, um, I would say that in terms of models and uh, ways to be able to continue to carry this work of uh, not forgetting how housing is related to health and not forgetting the importance of furthering affordable housing and also not forgetting the importance of building uh, healthy uh, neighborhoods, right? And addressing um, the, these investments in an equitable way. Um, I would say that uh, faith-based leaders, critically important, um, partners, community leaders, critically important partners. We have uh, seen firsthand here in the state of California as we have been um, very focused on getting the COVID-19 vaccine, how important it is for government to partner with faith-based leaders um, just on the vaccine. Um, California is at about 34 million uh, vaccinations um, with about 15 million uh, people fully vaccinated. And we learned early on that we uh, couldn't do this just uh, alone through like health clinics and um, you know, to the, through the traditional sort of uh, approaches. We had to create um, those partnerships that included faith-based leaders, uh, churches, uh, and folks on the ground. Um, so I think that that is you know, uh, important for us to continue to, to do in and all of the other efforts. We are you know, currently very focused. Uh, you mentioned um, at the beginning, Pamela, that earlier in the week, um, Governor Newsom uh, announced uh, a tw $12 billion investment in furthering affordable housing and addressing uh, homelessness with a goal of ending family homelessness uh, in five years. And this is historic, right? It, it's never been done and of course, um, we still need the legislature to support and, and, and concur and approve uh, the, the governor's um, budget proposal. Uh, and the hard work then becomes when we get to implementation. Um, and so I guess what I you know, would, would say um, to, to uh, listeners is to, to work with us as we also address the questions that exist in communities when it comes to creating more affordable housing. I think that there continues to be stigma about what is affordable housing, who lives in affordable housing communities. I don't think that there's still sort of uh, an appreciation for 
how uh, important it is for us to do everything possible to keep families um, housed in housed in um, housing that is of quality and that is affordable. Uh, so really continuing um, to serve as um, partners and uh, amplifying and um, raising awareness of the benefits um, of investing in affordable housing, right? And um, government, you know, state government, local government, federal government. Um, I think we're in, in this, you know, kind of very unique place where we are laser focused on this, but we know we can't do this alone. Um, we, we need to continue to, you know, fortify and strengthen those partnerships. Um, and so, you know, we look forward to continuing to work with the American you know, Heart Association, of course, to work with enterprise and to work with local leaders and faith-based leaders to be able to do so. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. And um, Eduardo, would love for you to um, leave us with closing words from the American Heart Association. And after you make your comments, I will close us out. You have the floor, sir. Off mute, off mute though. I'll be brief. I'm, you know, the whole day had gone by and I hadn't heard those words. So um, I, got my, I got my apple. Um, uh, I'll be brief. Places of worship can be change agents for lasting change, and um, the the those that's what we heard from Miss Wagner and from uh, Secretary Castro Ramirez. That's what we heard, um, and examples of it. I myself have had the opportunity to work uh, uh, parish health ministry programs, um, uh, faith communities that were training grounds for community health workers, um, and. Um, Pamela, myself, the rest of the AHA team has had experiences um, while we've been at AHA, um, and all of that has contributed to where we are today at this time, where we are in partnership with Enterprise um, and in partnership with those of you on this call today, trying to establish a growing network, a national network of faith-based organizations that can transform land and property assets into affordable housing, which equals opportunities for families to thrive. So I'll just close with, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Ms. Wagner, thank you very much. Secretary Castro Ramirez, now I know why I like you. You spent some time in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and uh, I, I, we might have overlapped even for a little bit of time. Um, and uh, those who are participating, thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to this really, really important enterprise. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And um, I apologize. I, you know, I'm so, you, I, I consider each of you as um, friends and colleagues. And so, Apologies if I did not utilize your formal um, titles um, this evening, but I do consider you. Pamela, Pamela, so it's, okay. it's okay. I'm just okay. so loud by the fact that we have a secretary of housing on our call. I needed to say it over and over and over again. And um, some of our other colleagues, um, um, uh, and I won't, I, you know, um, are all caught up in title. And this is a time where we need to pay tribute to that title. So I was doing it in honor of um, a Latina who's the Secretary of Housing in California. Uh, and much you respect. Make me cry. Here, 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 here. here, here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, let me just say, I can't go behind it, Wardo, but let me just say this. Thank you. That's what I can say on behalf of the American Heart Association for lending your voice, your expertise, um, and committing your passion because of your purpose and mission in life. It is critically clear because you speak so eloquently and so um, in a very confirmative way about your conviction around this work. And I believe it's the reason why all of us are working so hard to take this opportunity and seize it right now that we have in our country 
to become the, the best trusted partner in our communities so that we can have the best outcomes. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.